news coming from the U.S. Supreme Court taking action or maybe lack thereof in likely a set of cases that will determine the constitutional future of so-called assault weapon bans, high capacity magazine restrictions, and many other core constitutional rights where the Second Amendment is concerned. And I can't believe I have to say this, but sure, you have a right to possess weapons, the, ar the government argues, but do you have a right to actually purchase weapons? Because the government is saying, no, you don't. That's actually what we're talking about here right now. The case we're talking about is the National Association for Gun Rights versus Naperville. And there's actually two different laws that's going on here. And I don't want to get lost in the weeds because I've covered a lot of this before. So I'm linking that down in the description box below. But I want to tie people off here because there's probably a new audience coming into this. If for no other reason than the fact that these cases are probably going to be going to the U.S. Supreme Court in the next year to 18 months, and our constitutional future is going to be on the line with them. So we're not going to be doing a big deep dive on things. I want to focus this on three particular issues to make sure that folks get caught up here. Also, I've been coughing. This is my third time trying to record this video, so I apologize, but I'm going to be sucking down some water on occasion because I, I can't spend all night doing reshoots on this. So the first thing we're going to be talking about here is the right to purchase firearms. Now, we've actually gotten some great case law, thank you, Illinois, from Illinois, or more particularly, I think it was Chicago, within the last decade because you see Illinois and Chicago decided, oh, it's going to be fun if we try to shut down gun ranges, you know, the place where you can actually exercise your second amendment right kind of like shutting down a library or something like that right when it comes to the first amendment well court stepped in and said you know what if you have a right to possess firearms then you have a right to use firearms and then if you start shutting down places where you can exercise that right that's going to be no good so illinois through their aggressive and hostile anti-constitutional push actually has basically given us some more, I'm not going to say more rights, but they've recognized some more rights. They've given us more case law to recognize those rights. So at least there's some good in that. But now we're getting into the question of, do you have a right to purchase? Where we're coming from in this and what the government's trying to use is they're trying to use DC versus Heller. And DC versus Heller, which is of course the landmark 2008 US Supreme Court decision, did throw out a couple comments about basically, look, we're not trying to upset the apple cart when it comes to commercial regulation and things like that. I'm paraphrasing here. Well, the government's trying to say, whoa, they don't want to set up, you know, upset their commercial apple cart here. So I think that's the court's way of saying we're not necessarily trying to overturn the FFL system and things like that, though we'll find out. Well, the, the federal government's trying to say you don't have a right to purchase firearms, but sure, you have a right to possess firearms. And that's what Illinois is saying. I say federal government because the feds have argued that elsewhere in other cases. Here we have Illinois trying to argue that here in Illinois, you do not have a right to purchase firearms. Guys, if you heard me say this before, I want to repeat it again for you. Basically, all rights are rooted in property rights. Constitutional rights and property rights go hand in hand. You don't have a right to firearms. You don't have a right to a Second Amendment if you have no access to the property to use that, i.e. weapons. You have no right to self-defense if you do not have right to the weapons and the tools to do that. Just like you don't have a right to free speech if you're not allowed to purchase or possess books. You don't have a right to freedom of religion if you're not allowed to travel to and from and observe holy days and gather and worship and do all those things. That all requires place, commute, property, to gather, all that kind of stuff. All rights fundamentally come back down to property rights. So always watch the ball on that. We also then have the big issue here of whether or not magazines are an accessory. And even if they are or are not, are they constitutionally protected? Now, don't confuse this case, which is coming out of the Northern District Court of Illinois, with the one that came out of the Southern District Court of Illinois, where we did a if I have to say so myself, I think a pretty decent video covering a lot of the, the ins and outs of that particular law, because in that particular law, actually the judge did a fantastic beatdown of Illinois, where he pointed out that Illinois' own firearms expert classified weapons as, well, that's a high capacity magazine or pardon, that's a high capacity weapon. It's a high capacity firearm. In other words, Illinois' own expert blended the lines and blurred the lines of what's where and all that other kind of stuff. But we're seeing this come up elsewhere. We saw this going to be coming up in Rhode Island as well as many other states. 
And basically, the government's attack on this is magazines and accessories are not protected by the Second Amendment. And of course, the judges and pro 2 ape folks and pro self-defense people are saying, what could be more part of the Second Amendment and whether or not you have a right to a firearm and right to possess a firearm than, you know, the immediate capacity of whether or not that firearm can function, whether that firearm can load ammunition, which of course goes back to, look, do you want to have a one shotgun? Do you want to have a 10 shotgun, a 15 shotgun, you name it. Remember, my experience as a former state criminal prosecutor here, bad guys, if they're doing a home invasion, and I, I did a study on this, you can correct me down in the comment field, 100% of home invasions happen in the home. And almost every home invasion I've ever seen in my professional capacity is as either a state criminal prosecutor or a self or a uh, home defense, pardon, a uh, criminal defense attorney, home defense attorney too, um, is uh, there's always multiple bad guys going in. So how many shots are you going to need, governor? Are you going to need 5, 10, 15? In Illinois, they're setting it 15 for pistols, for 10 for rifles. But again, I don't want to beat a dead cow there on this. The big thing is going to be whether or not, or they're all huge things here, but one of the big things is going to be the constitutionality of AR-15s and their future so-called assault weapons bans. So we're not only talking about AR-15s, we're talking about AK-47, 74, Steyr, AUGs, just that whole class of weapons that are out there, i.e. semi-automatic, generally uh, center fire um, uh, rifles is what we're talking about. I think Illinois banned well over 100 different types of rifles, well different type of firearms under this particular issue here. The legal precepts that are, we're working on in order to determine whether or not it's constitutional is basically a couple different things. Is there going to be, uh, if it's protected by the Second Amendment, then Illinois is going to have to show how there is a national tradition of regulating firearms like these. Illinois is trying to say it's not protected by the Second Amendment at all because it's a dangerous and unusual weapon, which is basically a loophole that's out there that comes from English common law. If you want to see me do a video about that, I've actually been doing some research on that topic. Let me know in the comment field below. I can try to accelerate that. So Illinois is saying, look, it's a dangerous weapon. It fits this loophole of being dangerous and unusual. And unfortunately for them, we've done kind of a fun video talking about just how absolutely insanely safe AR-15s are. So if you don't believe me, for example here, actually AR-15s, and I've got some notes I got to pull up here because it's it's too good. I don't want to screw it up. AR-15s, and there's some loose math. I linked the actual full video in the description box below. I won't go through everything here. But AR-15s actually may cause less homicides or may participate in less homicides each year than there are deaths in the United States involving lawnmowers, bees, ladders, autoerotic asphyxiation, deer, constipation. Yes, we fact-checked that, by the way. Um, people being hit by the bus, swimming pools, falling out of bed, you name it. And if you consider and that's just by raw number. We're not even looking at rate. If we look at the number of homicides per firearm, keep in mind that AR-15 style rifles, we're not even talking AKs and all the other kind of stuff, just AR-15 style rifles by themselves are probably the most popular single firearm type sold in the United States. Their production accounts for, I'm going to read this, nearly half of the rifles produced in 2018 alone and nearly 20% of all firearms sold in 2020. You would think that they would, should therefore account for at least something like, well, their rate of how much is in circulation for homicides. But if you actually look at homicides by percentage of firearms out there, this, depending on which number you want to believe, there's somewhere between 15 to 25 million AR-15s out there. They are insanely safe if you look at the homicide rates let alone if you just look at their overall rates. So those are all important things to keep in mind. And I also just want to point out as well, um, so we kind of covered a little bit of the common use by statistics as well as the fact that not so dangerous. But also the government's trying to move the line here. And this is going to be another question. I'm going to end with this one. Before I do, if you haven't had an opportunity to do so, all the YouTube things, please consider clicking like to get the content out there. Helps this channel grow. Helps the message get out there. And of course, you know I'm going to say, Please take a moment to subscribe to make sure you don't miss any of our future content. So now back to this. The government's trying to move the goalposts from where the court set them. The court was talking about firearms as being protected by the Second Amendment 
when they are basically um, in common use. The government is adding something and the anti-Second Amendment crowd, the anti-self-defense crowd, and that's what they are. They are anti-self-defense. If they're trying to take away the tools for self-defense, that's what they are. The anti-self-defense crowd is trying to do exactly what their, their tactics were pre um bait well really continuing to do so um where for decades we had to listen to the fact of, oh well that firearm is no sporting use they invented this constitutionality is sporting use sporting use sporting use right well that's not dead they're still basically saying that but they've moved the line they changed the wording but kept the strategy the strategy is now it has to be used for self-defense in common use for self-defense is what they are arguing First off, that's not a thing, okay? It's common use. Secondly, even if that is a thing, challenge accepted. According to one study of AR-15 owners and people who buy them, 34.6% of owners of AR-15s utilize these rifles for self-defense outside their home and 61.9% utilize them for self-defense in the home. Those are some pretty big numbers. 34% outside the home, 61% inside the home. So again, I don't know where the government's trying to go on this, but if you want us to stay on this thread, well, rest assured, I'm going to do that. But if you want to see any deep dives on things, let me know in the comment field.